So here we're going to talk about IV estimation and proxy variables. The first element of the lecture I want to, to strengthen here in that online clip is one reason why we may need uh, an instrumental variables estimation measurement error. So let me introduce at first what it means and, I will, and then we'll see what the consequences are. So here's our model. Right. We have a dependent variable, we have an explanatory variable, it's called xt asterisk. Everything standard but for this asterisk. Now, this asterisk is here to indicate that this variable is measured inaccurately. What do, you mean, what do we mean by this? Now, what we mean is that the, the real value of xt is xt asterisk. However, what we observe is xt and these two things these two things are not equal the difference between the two is this measurement error okay call this me or vt that is the measurement error in the lecture we talked about the example when that could be for instance income i think that's what we mentioned in in the lecture so this is the setup we want to use xt asterisk but we don't have it. What we have is xt, and that is different. Before we continue, we need a number of assumptions, because we have now introduced a, a new error term. We already have our, I'll just do that in blue, the error terms, the ut. And this, I haven't said that here, but let's assume that this is as nice properties. Let's say it's normally distributed with a variance sigma u squared, so it's almost scholastic, so that's fine. Now we also have the vt, and we may have to make a number of assumptions with respect to the vt. So the assumption we're going to make, do them in red, is some conventional ones. Firstly, we're going to say that the expected value is equal to zero, and we're going to say that the variance is going to be equal to sigma v squared as opposed to sigma u squared. So this is all fairly standard. What we now also have to do is we have to say how vt is related to the other random variable which we have, the ut, and we will have to establish how vt is related to our x, xt asterisk. XT asterisk. And the assumption we're going to make is that these guys are uncorrelated and these guys are uncorrelated. So this is our assumption we're going to make. Out of these assumptions, we can now think about how we would proceed in practice. So in practice, we would possibly do the following. Are some equations from the lecture notes. Um, we'll use them. So we start again. I'll just replicate the original model 177 down here for starters. So this one is just exactly the same as 177. Now we know from 178 that xt, uh, we can reformulate that to we can isolate xt, and that, that's x, sorry, xt asterisk, and that is the same as xt minus vt. So we can replace the xt asterisk in 177 with this relationship here. So we get yt is alpha plus beta xt minus vt plus ut. Now here we could just factor this out, so we get beta times xt, so this bit is here, and we get beta, beta times vt, but that minus, and that is going to be here. Okay, and otherwise we have the ut and the alpha here. Now we have alpha, beta, xt, and back here we now have two random terms, the ut and the vt. Both of them are unobserved. And perhaps I should 
just say that here as well if that wasn't obvious already that measurement of error is of course unobserved the only thing which we see that's why it was read as well is the queen bit the observed xt so what we're now gonna do is we're just gonna briefly summarize these two guys and call them epsilon t okay but we have to keep in mind they're a combination of two error terms ut minus beta times vt that's what we hear we have here the definition in 180 so the problem you bring in the next the next bit so the important thing to realize is that it is this equation we cannot estimate because while we have observations for yt, we do not have observations for xt. Here in 179, however, we have yt and we have xt because that's our observed variable. So this 179, this is actually the equation we would usually estimate because we have observations for the dependent and the explanatory variable. But the question now is, in that equation is assumption A4 valid? So what do we have to ask? Is the explanatory variable uncorrelated to the error term? That's what we want. If that's the case, then we know that our coefficient estimator for beta has nice properties. So this is the question we therefore need to ask. Is there a relationship between the xt and the epsilon t? Now, to do this, we need to understand what the xt and the epsilon t are. The xt, according to 178, is the sum of the xt asterisk and our measurement error, vt. So we'll just replace the xt here with xt asterisk plus vt. And then the epsilon t, we've just learned from here that epsilon t is just ut minus beta vt. So ut minus beta vt. Okay. This line here is, turns out, it's just exactly the same line. I don't know why that appears here. Okay, so let me just rub this out. But let me perhaps replace this with another line, okay, so that is something you will not have in, in the lecture notes. And I'm just doing, from here to here, is, I just uh, did a couple of steps, and I'll introduce one of these steps here in this extra line. What we'll do here is, inside the expectation, we'll just factor out our product. Okay, so the expectation here is just going to be the expectation of xt asterisk times ut minus beta, so we have that one times that one, then we have that one times that one, so we have minus beta times xt asterisk times vt then we have vt times ut, so plus vt times ut. I was to squeeze a little bit and I actually I'll continue behind here. I wasn't meant to fit in here. Minus beta times vt times vt. We'll write this in a second, we'll write this behind. Here we go. Hey, that's not what I wanted. Let me just move this. Um, so we'll just move this here. A little bit nicer. here. 
a little bit of an operation. Anyway, here we go. So now we have the expectation of four bits. Now we know something about some of them. And we know that due to our assumptions. Remember the assumptions we made, that here they appear okay, on the side. Expected value of vt times ut is equal to zero. Now vt times ut, that appears here. Okay? So the expectation of this guy here is going to be zero. So that will, I'll just do that in a different color, this one here will fall away. That will be zero once we have the expectation. Then vt times xt asterisk was also zero. Where do we have that? We have that. Where do we have that? Here, xt times vt. So that's zero. Multiplied with beta, but it will still be zero. So then we have also xt asterisk times ut. And now this is something I possibly haven't explicitly mentioned. Okay. So that's possibly an assumption I have to make here. xt asterisk times ut is equal to zero. So we said if we had our um, unobservable, if we had xt asterisk, that would be uncorrelated to u. Okay, so that would be an exogenous regressor. That means expectation of xt asterisk times ut, that will also be zero, so that will fall away. So that means the only thing that is left is this guy here. Okay, the expectation of this, of negative beta vt times vt. So that is, we can bring the coefficient out, negative beta times the expectation of vt squared. Now, since our expected value for vt is equal to zero, that means that the expected value of vt squared is basically nothing else but the variance. And we call that sigma squared v. Now, sigma squared v, this guy here, is going to be larger than zero. And that means the entire bit is going to be unequal to zero. Depending on the size, on the sign of beta, it's going to be positive or negative. We don't know. Positive beta, that term will be negative. But the important thing is un it's unequal to zero. So, what have we established? That the expected value of xt times the error epsilon t is not equal to zero. So this xt and that epsilon t are correlated with each other. And what is the consequence of this? Beta hat OLS in equation 179 is not consistent. it is not unbiased either. Okay, so that is the problem. So we said in the lecture that if we have this situation, or the, if we have measurement error in the explanatory variable, we have to deal with this somehow, because just estimating by OLS will not work. Also made a note that not all measurement error will lead to this, Particular measurement error in the dependent variable turns out to be not a problem. But measurement error in the explanatory variable is a significant problem. I said in the lecture that the solution to this is to use an IV estimation. Okay, there were other reasons why we may want to use IV estimation. For instance, I just mentioned that if we had simultaneous equations. Okay, We didn't really deal with this, but in this case you will equally end up with, if you pick one out of perhaps several simultaneous equations, if you want to estimate that, you end up with a similar situation like this, where you have where your explanatory variable is related to the error term. And then you have to use IV estimation. And Perhaps also if you have a, an omitted variable, we talked about that in the, in the lecture, a relevant, relevant omitted variable. We know, you already know from semester one, you end up with a breach of this assumption, the 
um, explanatory variable may be correlated to the error term. And one solution to this may be to use an IV estimation. It turns out, however, that an alternative solution to this problem, a relevant omitted variable, may also be a proxy variable. of course section 9.3.1 and what you what we often do is we, when we have relevant omitted variable we will use proxy variables if we have a proxy variable and we use instrumental variables estimation if we do not variable. Okay, so the available availability, if you're in this situation where you have a relevant omitted variable, the availability of a proxy variable will determine whether you use it as a proxy variable or whether we have to do IV estimation. So what is this magical thing, a proxy variable? So here we go. This is from the lecture notes, equation 188. We'll start out with our assuming that this is the true model. Okay, DGP here stands for Data Generating Pro Process or uh, an alternative which is also right, the true model. Okay, so we have X2 explanatory variables x1 and x2 tilde. Now the problem is that this guy, x2 tilde, is not observable. And that will often be the case, especially if we have things that are sort of somewhat intangible, like intelligence or compassion, were the two examples we have. Now, quite often, we possibly feel that X2 tilde, and I'll use that loosely for starters, can be proxied by another variable, and we call that x2. Okay, so x2 tilde and x2 are not the same, but x2 is a proxy for x2 tilde. And then the question is, you know, can we estimate the following model? Actually, I'll just use the formula from the lecture notes. Okay, so can we basically replace question is, can we replace x to tilde with x to question mark? So can we just estimate this model where we replace x to tilde with x to? Now, before we continue, we have to in a way assume that how we, we have to make an assumption of how x2 and x2 tilde are related. Okay, so this was our unobserved, this was our observed proxy. And what we have to do is we have to assume that there's some linear relationship between these two. Of course, this one is unobservable, and only this one is observable. So that means we can never really test this. Um, but you have to make some sort of, it has to be not obvious that there is a nonlinear relationship between the two. So, now firstly we have to recognize the following. You have to recognize, recognize that estimating 189 cannot deliver a reliable estimate for beta 2. Okay, so if we are really after this coefficient beta 2, using a proxy is not going to help us. So this is not the point of using the proxy, but what if we are really interested in beta 1? Now remember, 
just omitting x2 does not do the trick because then this stuff would wander into the error term and that means that potentially this new combined error term may be correlated with the x1 okay and then we have the problem that uh, our explanatory variable is correlated to the error term and we get inconsistent parameter estimates even for the beta 1. So the question is can the use can the use of a proxy for x2 tilde deliver consistent estimates on small samples and biased estimates for beta 1. Okay, so th this is the problem we are really try trying to solve. And it turns out that indeed the answer to this question is yes. The answer, so can we use, actually I should have used the question mark here, and the answer is yes, that's great, if, and now here there come two assumptions, if firstly that x2, that proxy variable, is also uncorrelated with our error u. So what we need is that x1 and x2 are uncorrelated to u. This one we can't observe the, ah uh, sorry, where do we go? Here I started. So what we need initially is that we need to know that x1 and x2 tilde are correlated to u. x2 tilde is unobservable, so um, two unobservables are uncorrelated with each other. That's going to be difficult to, to think about. But what we do need to assume in addition to that is that if we use that proxy variable x2 that that is also uncorrelated to u. So basically all our three variables involved, one of which, the red underlined one, which is unobserved, need to be uncorrelated to the u. Secondly, what we require is that if we are thinking of x2 being a proxy for the x2 tilde. That means the expected value of x2 tilde should be somehow related to that x2 in a linear way, as we argued before. But importantly, it shouldn't matter whether when we model our unobserved variable with our proxy, it shouldn't matter whether we take our x1 into consideration as well. Okay, so that's what you see here. In here, there is no x1. So these two expectations, the expectation for x2 tilde, conditional on x1 and x2, and the expectation of x2 tilde conditional on x2, they should be the same. And what that basically means is that x1 cannot explain x2 tilde beyond what x2 can explain of x2 tilde. So if x2 tilde is, as we discussed in the lecture, uh, intelligence and we are using an IQ for as a proxy, then we need to make sure that IQ is related to x2 tilde, but this variable x1 doesn't add any explanatory power to explaining x2 tilde. As x2 tilde is unobservable, this is a mind experiment or thought experiment we have to do here. And very often this is where the problem starts. It's sometimes very difficult to find this proxy, which clearly is the only variable that will explain variation in the unobserved variable x2 tilde. Okay, so. This means that this root, remember where we came to the proxy variable, we said we want to, we're considering this technique here if we have an omitted relevant variable and if we have a proxy variable. Do you have a proxy variable? 
Well, that depends on whether you have a variable that can x2 that can meet these two conditions. If we don't, then if you have the case of a relevant omitted variable, we have to go this way. We have to use IV estimation. Okay, that all, I didn't mention that. Of course, if you have values for the relevant omitted variable, you include it. Okay. So actually, um, I should add this here, relevant omitted variable, include the variable if available. If available. If it's not available, then we consider proxy or alternatively the IV estimation. So it turns out that as proxies aren't really always readily available, we will often resort to what we discussed in section 9.3.2, IV is the estimation, instrumental variables estimation. So what do we have here? Let's start again with a basic model now written in matrix form. A basic model, dependent variable, matrix of explanatory variables, the first column may well be a constant, an error term, and our error term here we assume it's uh, that it is homoscedastic. But now importantly, the problem is that we are thinking of the situation where x and u are indeed correlated. Okay, so we don't have exogenous explanatory variables. So this is this is now the problem we are dealing with. And we know, just to summarize, if that is the case, then beta hat all s, which is x prime x inverse x prime y, is inconsistent. So we can't establish any nice properties for it. So as we discussed before, when can we get in this predicament? Well, we identified three different reasons. Measurement error, simultaneous equation, and uh, relevant omitted variables. They may all lead to this situation. So the question is, how do we deal with this? And this is really a big, big issue in econometrics. Let me just start a new file. So here's just our new file, gives me more space. Now I already said that before this x, this is going to be a matrix of variables. Let's for starters assume that the first column is just a column of ones and the second column is just a capital X and the second column was uh, variable x. I use a little x here for this is just a vector. And the problem is if we have, so if we now have the expected value of x prime u is unequal to zero, that has to be due to this bit here, that little x, because the constant can't be correlated to the error term. So this is the offender, the x. Now consider that we have another variable, consider another variable, little set. And let's assume that this has, this variable has the following two properties. Properties A and B, the first one, it is uncorrelated to u. The second one, it is correlated to x. Okay. So let this be the two, the two properties. How do we use this? How do we use this property? What 
should we replace? Should we replace X with Z? That seems quite sort of promising in a way, okay, because oh, Z is correlated to X, but it's uncorrelated to U. But we should recognize that then we are not really estimating, then we wouldn't be really estimating 193 anymore. What we would be estimating would be a model y equals z times, and now I shouldn't call it beta anymore, therefore I call it gamma plus and a different error term where the big z is equal to a constant again in the first column and the little z. Okay, so we would estimate if we just replace x with z, we're basically replacing the capital X with the capital Z and we're estimating this model, but this is not 193 because it has different explanatory variable and therefore different coefficients. So the answer to this is no. Okay. Now the next question you may, ask, uh, may have is, is Z a proxy variable? Mark. The answer to this is no as well. Certainly not in the sense how we discussed it before. Remember, we discussed proxy variables as a proxy for something that is unobservable. But x is observable. Okay, we have this. Okay, it is available. We have observations. So therefore, it is not a proxy variable how we discussed it in uh, 93. One actually, I think this is nine three two, right? So it's not a proxy variable. That unobservable variable, which may be the reason for this, is hidden in that error term. Okay, if you have an unobserved but relevant variable, that's in the error term. It's not the x that is observed. So it's not a proxy variable either. So how do we use this set? Or we use it in the following way. We propose we propose the following estimator for beta in equation one nine three. So beta hat is equal to z prime x inverse z prime y. And this is what we call an instrumental variables estimator. So importantly here, first thing you have to realize that this is not not an estimate of model of this model. Okay. Because if we were to estimate the coefficient in here, we would be estimating z prime z inverse z prime y. But that's not what we have. We have z prime x inverse z prime y. So in fact we have three terms here. Okay, we have the, the x which is defined up here. We have the z which is defined up here, and we have the y. So this is what's called the instrumental variables estimator. You may now ask, hang on, well, what's the role of this set in here? Well, why does that occur? It doesn't occur in our original, in our original model 193. And immediately you may ask, being a well-trained econometrician by now, well, does that still give us an unbiased and a consistent estimator of beta of this one, model 193? Now, your training should kick in. What would you do if you wanted to establish the expected value? So, I just asked the question. Is 
the expected value of beta hat iv equal to the unknown beta from model 193. By the way, this is equation in the lecture notes. Let me just briefly confirm that. 198. So this is 198. So you know how to establish this. In the OLS case, your next step was to replace y with the model. So what we would do from here to establish, to answer that question is we would do beta hat iv is z prime x inverse z prime and now instead of y we use our model. Our model is of course x beta plus u. So that immediately gives you the following z prime x inverse z prime x beta plus z prime x inverse z prime u. And of course these two guys cancel each other out. So what we get is beta plus z prime x inverse z prime u. So now that is still beta hat iv. This was just algebra so far. Now you would ask the question what is the expected value of beta hat iv and now it turn, turns out, I'm not going to go through the detail here, that, but it's very straightforward just using the techniques which you know, it turns out if we make recourse to the assumptions which we made that the expected value of beta hat iv is indeed equal to beta and fantastically that means it is an unbiased estimator. Okay, so that's a great result. So although we use this set, in addition to our explanatory variable x, we, it turns out we get another beta. So a different estimator. This one is unbiased. And remember, beta hat, if we were to estimate a OLS estimator, so if we had estimated beta hat, let's just say OLS, x prime x inverse x prime y, that would not, would have been biased. Okay, because because of this result. Now we have a different one and we get an unbiased. So that's quite magical, but important, our instrumental variable Z has to have these properties. So this uh, estimator will also have a variance variance for beta hat IV and that variance formula uh, comes basically straight from the lecture notes and here it is. I don't want to talk much about it, it's just it includes Z and X but these are matrices, this can be calculated and it includes the uh, variance of the error terms as in our normal variance formula and we would need a sample estimate for that but you know how to get that. Let me just generalize this problem slightly. Okay. So, what if our matrix X doesn't only have a constant and one X, but now what if there are several X's? Okay, let's say we have K explanatory variable and a constant. And let's say that of these variables, there's only one variable Let's say this one, x1, which is correlated with the error terms. And all other x's, so expected value of xj with u is equal to 0 for j equals 2 to k, okay, for all the remaining variables. So what do we need then? How does then, how can we apply 
these instrument variables estimator, can we still apply it? And the answer is yes. You need a matrix set that the status looks very similar, column of ones. Now we need an instrument for that. So let's call it Z1 for the instrument. Now for all these other variables, you can basically just put in all the other variables. So basically X2 is an instrument for itself. X3 is an instrument for itself. And what are the properties of Z1? Okay, the properties of Z1 have to be that Z1 and U are uncorrelated and that Z1 and X1 are correlated. And it turns out the stronger the correlation, the stronger the correlation, the better. And therefore it's obvious why X2 should, should be the instrument to X2 itself, because the correlation is 1. That's the strongest possible correlation you can get. Okay, otherwise it's exactly the same, because you see in our uh, IV formula, for our IV estimator, we have ZX, Z and Y, but these are matrices, so these matrix operations, they work perfectly well doesn't matter how many columns we have here, as long as X and Z have the same number of columns. Of course, that's important. Let me very quickly go for an empirical example with this. It's an example from the Woolrich book, example 15.4 in the Woolrich book, and it also appears in the lecture slides. I have EBS here and I have a EBS file that I will make available to you that should be available in the platform site once you see this with all the variables in the it's called the card file. Now there are all sorts of variables you can uh, in I also give to you that uh, a file called card description card.des you can see descriptions of all these variables. Importantly in here there are wages for individuals, individual employees, and then there are all sorts of variables. Uh, for instance, um, how many years of schooling they have, importantly, what their wage is. Where was the wage? The wage was somewhere. Here is the wage, and we have the log wage. It turns out we'll use the log wage as dependent variable. And they are married, and all sorts of stuff. And regional, these are all regional dummies. Now what we want to do, let me briefly go back to, to here. So we have Woodridge example 15.4. 15.4, we want to, to estimate a relationship where, uh, sorry, the log wage LW for a worker is a function of alpha naught plus alpha naught plus alpha one times education. So it makes sense that the education of an individual will have an impact on the individual's wage plus alpha 2 times experience, so how much experience they have, alpha 3 experience squared. Now that is because it is not true that the older that you bet, the higher your wage will be at some stage. That relationship will, uh, will reverse. And all sorts of other variable, for instance, what this skin color they have, unfortunately that still makes a difference and certainly when these data, these data are quite old uh, when they were available and some regional regional dummies. So what I do 
here where yeah, is my views the regression which we want to estimate is the following I've already done it okay but I just show you all the variables uh, we have log wage as the dependent variable and education experience experience squared black SMSA and all the rest are regional dummies so these are exactly the results which you can see in the lecture notes and indeed in Woodridge and we see the education variable here we get a coefficient of 0.075 approximately so every additional year of education has a certain impact well what that number exactly means is not the most important thing here the problem is the following so we have all sorts of uh, let me say regional dummies plus an error term now this error term importantly will contain the impact of an omitted relevant variable and let's say intelligence clearly workers, whatever intelligent philosophically means, but clearly workers that are more intelligent, such as parables, will get a, a, a larger log wage. Now, intelligence is not observable, but it is quite likely that these two guys are correlated. So it's quite likely that the amount of education you got is correlated to intelligence on average I think it's possibly fair to say that more intelligent people get more education individually there will be a lot of variation but that means that the expectation of the error term the uh, sorry the education variable times the error term is going to be unequal to zero so we need an instrument instrument needed. What is proposed in the example in Woolrich that was proposed by some, some other authors in a paper a while back is to use as an instrument the following variable. So they propose to use the variable near for college for. Now let's briefly go to the script and see what it is. That is a dummy variable, so it equals 1, if you live close enough to some four-year college. There's some, some sort of, uh, I think, uh, on a, a college, what's that in the US, on uh, a, the, the first sort of degree. It's one, so what it doesn't tell us well, what close enough means, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, so if you live close enough, you have a one in here. If you live far enough, you live further away. Now, why is that? Why do we use this? Because there's some good argument to say whether you live near college should really be uncorrelated to intelligence. There's no reason to a priori believe that these two are related because that's just where you live. Some people may challenge that but at the same time it may very well be that if you tend to live closer to a college well perhaps you get more education. It's just easier for you to to get further education. So we're saying there's no correlation here but there is correlation here. So that's the, the assumption made. As intelligence is not observable, we can't really test it. Okay? It's impossible to test whether these two are indeed uncorrelated. We could actually test the correlation between these two, and it turns out that the correlation coefficient between these two is approximately 0 0.14. Okay? And given the number of observations we have, that is statistically significant. It's not very large. So remember what we had here, what we said we really want this correlation to be the strong 
as strong as possible at this. It's not a very strong correlation, but it's often the sort of correlations you have to be happy with instrumental variables. So what we therefore now need is so what we want to use is we want to near want to use near C4 as an instrument for education. How do we do this in eViews? So we go to the estimation bit and in the estimation method we're going to go to two-stage least squares. Now, why it is called two-stage least squares, I don't want to talk about that. There's good reason for this, but I don't want to talk about it. So, in instrument list, what we basically have to specify here is what our matrix set looks like. Okay, we basically have to specify this guy. And we said we want it to be basically exactly the same as X, just for the place where we have our offending variable, and that's the education variable here. So instead of education, we will want to have our near C4 variable. So let's go here. So we'll do that quite straightforward. We'll just copy and paste. And instead of education, we'll write near C4. And I click OK. And now you see an estimation, and you can see that in our instrument list we have all our variables, but instead of education, we have new C4. Now I've, I've made actually a mistake. I have also copied, you can see in here, the actual dependent variable itself. L of H. Now that shouldn't be, because remember the first value here is the dependent variable, so I have to take that out. Dependent variable is not part of X. X is really only this bit. Okay, and we have to see the constant at the end here. So I've deleted the first one, so instead of the first dependent variable education, we now have near C4. Here we go. We have our instrument list, so this is basically what our set looks like. But as depend as explanatory variable, we have still exactly the same list before. Okay, so the education still appears here. So it's important we did not replace education with near C4. We just used near C4 as an instrument for education. And now we see a different coefficient of 0.131, so it actually turns out that the actual effect of education is stronger. The fact that it was that education was most likely correlated with the error term obscured the effect of education. So our IV estimate of that alpha 1 turns out to be larger than the OLS estimate, which we know to be biased. So this is really all I want to, to show you. I want to show you that doing these IV estimations is extremely easy in eViews. The difficult bit is the identification of an instrumental variables. And you can see here the fact that we had to settle for a variable that is only just correlated to education tells you that this is often a difficult job, but it is often the only way to achieve consistent unbiased estimates for these alpha 1. Okay, and that's what the key, that's what we wanted to achieve.